Uh, greetings to everyone watching us and the welcome to this show. Again, I'm with the Bruce Afram, a constitutional lawyer, and actually is a lawyer in the case involving Moseven, uh, his son, and the very many others at the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, Bruce, first say hi to everyone watching us and then we get started. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here. JB has a great show and it's good to be talking to you all. Uh, thank you. By the way, we are glad to have you again. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, getting started, can you provide an overview of the case uh, that you and your team are handling at the International Criminal Court? Because very many would love to know that. Yes. Well, as you know, JB, we filed the case in the summer and the court acknowledged receiving our materials. We submitted 215 affidavits from witnesses who have said they saw or they were a part of torture in the various detention centers, mostly up. So we have hundreds of people who have testified in the Special Forces Command as to the torture that they've experienced. And this is unusual because usually one brings a case to these forums asking for investigation, but we're now coming to them with more than 200 witnesses, many of whom detail very graphic and brutal acts by the Special Forces Command and other people in the government. And we even have four people who testify that they themselves were confronted with Mahuzi. The, gen the general's son at these torture centers, and he was in command and was fully aware of what they went through and was commanding these detention centers. So we have witnesses who said Mahuzi has the person running these torture centers, and we have over 200 people who explained how they were brutalized. So we have a very strong case we've made uh, for the ICC. Now, they have to decide whether they take the case, you know. They're prosecutors and they investigate, but we've given them the strongest evidence we can. And they're going to take time. It's not a quick process. Yes. Having said that, uh, could you elaborate on how the International Criminal Court uh, interacts with the institutions such as the police, the army? How does the International Criminal Court interact with the, the police department and other security organizations when it comes to abductions and other disruptions aimed at the dissenting voices? Can the entire department be held accountable at the ICC or they have to deal with the individuals personally? Well, what happens is individuals are charged by the ICC. The ICC is a court that deals with people. The International Court of Justice deals with countries but the ICC brings charges against people. So they can bring charges against General Museveni, his son, you know, Mr. Ananga, other people who have participated in running torture centers, and they can bring charges against individual officers or soldiers who have done these things. And when they come to a country, they set up an office and all of the governmental offices must cooperate because there's a treaty. And Uganda has signed the treaty of the court and when the court mm -hmm. comes to Uganda, Uganda's government must cooperate. So what the court will do, JB, is it will come in and will interview those witnesses we have. And then mm -hmm. it may decide to interview police and government officials. But normally a government is required to cooperate with the ICC because it's a treaty and that's the law. Uh, actually, ever since His Excellency Bobby Wine and his team managed to drag him seveny, and his son, of course, and the, those others you mentioned, uh, there has been some bit of uh, an atmosphere, you know, that gripped him seven his camp. They are not settled. And actually, that's why His Excellency Bobby Wine managed to embark on a national only tour, opening up offices in different parts of the country, uh, of course, under the national unity platform. But of course, after the first phase, as if we are witnessing a change of uh, winds whereby police is now trying to come up with you know, statements seemingly blocking him from continuing with the tour. Are, are you aware of this and what does this speak to you? You know, it's interesting, JB. The government came up with that only on the last day of the tour. So once yes. the tour, the government said, oh, we're stopping it. But they were afraid to stop it beforehand. 
So they only say we're going to stop it after it ended. They were afraid while it was going on to stop it. Now, you all saw those huge crowds, 20,000 at minimum, sometimes 50 or 100,000 people. Entire towns were filled with people, stadiums. The government no longer will dare to use violence against those people. Because if they kill people, if they gun them down, if they're beating them in front of cameras, then the ICC will indict. And so the government is now understanding it can no longer use raw, naked violence against these people who come to hear Bobby Wine. And the government knows that. And that's why they announced they're stopping the tour only on the last day after it's all over. So they're trying now to come up with excuses why not to let Bobby go again on tour. But they're making up stories that are very weak. They're saying, well, towns were crowded, stores had to close. There was traffic accidents. These aren't the statements of a government that thinks it's all powerful anymore. These are the statements of a government looking to make excuses. So it remains to be seen whether they're going to be able to stop a future tour. What are they going to do when these tens of thousands of people come out to see Bobby? They can't gun them down, and the soldiers won't do that anymore. They can't beat them up with sticks in front of cameras, because then they'll be indicted. So now the government is a tough position. It can't really block these protests. If it does, the officials in the government get indicted. So they're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't. This is the force of law. Law, even the threat of law, makes governments behave better. Uh, the way you are putting it out, it's like he, your cameras and lenses are still squarely focused on seven. Isn't the 215 evidence enough? You seem like you need more evidence in order to, you know, back up the case. Is it the case? Well, I think that we have enough evidence to make the International Criminal Court say there is a case here to investigate. Remember, mm -hmm. our job at this early stage in the case is only to show the court there's enough here that the court should come in and investigate. Then the court will do its own inquiry. So our job is only to give the court a taste of what's out there, to show the court that there's enough that has happened enough torture, enough brutalization that the court should launch the investigation. I think we've shown enough for that. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think we've done more than most cases do when they first come to the ICC. But remember, JB, it takes the court time. All judicial processes take time. And the court's going to take many months to go over this evidence. But in that time, the government now has to behave itself. Because if it uses violence and torture in public, at least, and guns people down or beats them in protests, then the court is absolutely going to act. So the government now has to be on its best behavior. Now we're seeing the results. People are no longer afraid to come out. Look at all those huge crowds that were no longer scared. They were yes. no longer General Museveni. This tells us what the rule of law can do. And I think people in the government also, in the NRM, are starting to understand that all of this violence has to come to an end that this way of running Uganda is old and has to change. And so I think we've made a lot of progress. Those huge rallies are a sign of that. Having talked about the 215 that they are enough uh, to make the case, uh, the last time we were here, actually after the show, uh, very many Ugandans were actually in need to know how safe is this evidence, these affidavits at the ICC. JB, let me say this. The International mm -hmm. Criminal Court takes very seriously the need to keep things confidential and to keep them secret. When someone signs an affidavit to the court, that does not ever get disclosed by the court. And in any communications, the court uses a code to deal with these affidavits. When a person signs a statement for, to the International Criminal Court, that statement is secret. It is confidential. The one guiding principle that the court has is absolute privacy. People are free to communicate to the court, and it will never disclose that information to the government of Uganda. That is an absolute. And everything you send to the court is safe. And let me tell you this. If people send statements to us, to the NUP, to me directly in America through the email, 
those statements are also safe. We will safeguard those. And when we send them to the ICC, they are kept secret and there's only a code used publicly. No name and no location and no house is ever disclosed publicly. So JB, I will say to the people of Uganda, the ICC is a safe place. And if you have something to tell them or tell us, you should feel free to send it. And I can even give my email address if you'd like um, for people to send to if you'd like me to. Actually, I wanted to ask you that if there is an official link or uh, the platform, because I believe very many concerned Ugandans would love to submit in more evidence. Please, you can go ahead and read it out. Uh, I'll also type it down in the comment section so that they can copy it and the share it among themselves. Okay, well, you can always write to the NUP and go to any NUP office or NUP person. You could also write to me at bruceafrin at icloud.com. And that's my name, B-R-U-C-E-A-F-R-A-N at icloud.com. And if you have a story of torture and abuse, we want to know. And we, want, we will then make sure that the right people come to you and we put that together in a witness statement. So that's one address people could use. They could write to me at bruceafrin at icloud.com and we will forward that to the team. And we have a confidential system and we have people outside of Uganda who can put together the documents. So it is a very safe system. Uh, thank you very much for that because very many people were asking me about that. And the, I'm asking you this on behalf of, uh, you know, human rights uh, defenders, activists, organizations, non-government organizations and all that. What is the process of uh, initiating a case at ISIS? What, what uh, does one need to go through the steps? And the, maybe if you can expound more on the type of evidence and how to file it. I believe they are concerned Ugandans would love also to drag the same people or other individuals to the International Criminal Court because the courts are back home. Of course, you know the story. Yes. Well, JB, mm. that's the first test. Can the mm. courts back home handle these cases? If the answer to that is no, then the ICC can step in. So that's the first step we use to show the court. We show the court that there is no real due process anymore in Uganda because the government controls the courts and threatens the judges. Now, in the ordinary case in Uganda, sure, the courts work, hopefully. But in a political case of torture, they don't work because the judges are often too afraid. And so what happens is people are charged. The judges want to release them and sometimes do. But then they're immediately put into the military courts so they never mm -hmm. get out. They can stay in for a year or two at a time, never get a court date. We've shown all this to the ICC. Uh, and this is the first step, showing the ICC that the Uganda courts can't work, that there's no due process in Uganda for those who are arrested and abused and tortured or charged with political offenses. That's number one. The next step we have to do is show the court that things such as torture, humiliation, degradation, abusive conduct are taking place. Because those are the things the court looks at. It doesn't look at ordinary crime. You know, mm -hmm. if two people get fight, even over politics, and one hits the other and injures them, the ICC doesn't get into that. What the ICC looks at is violations of human rights law, of the law of nations. Do we torture people and degrade them? Do we put them through pain and suffering in, in a prison or in a court? Do people get beaten because of their ethnicity or their politics or their religion? Do people get killed without ever even reaching a courtroom? Do women get abused? We had one person who wrote about how her uterus was destroyed by the abuse of the police and who literally grabbed her by her private parts when she was pregnant. She lost her baby and her uterus was lost. This is an example of degrading and humiliating treatment. People have been electrocuted in prison when they urinate. People are, are constantly whipped with wires. They're forced to dance 12, 20 hours in a row and are beaten if they fall down. All of this is forms of abuse. People have had flesh pulled out, fingers pulled out. All of this falls under the ICC. So we need to show them not only do the courts not work, 
but that these tortures are occurring. And once we've done that, we've done the basic job. But you have to have the evidence and you have to be able to truly put it together in witness statements so the ICC can see it. And it's not enough to just say, and I don't mean to diminish anybody, to say mm -hmm. I was arrested and raped. We have to have a description of when this occurred, what organization took them into custody, describe the details of what happened. It's not enough to say I was tortured. We need to know how were you tortured? Did you have flesh pulled out? Did you have chemicals put in your eyes? You know, were you forced to breathe gases? Were you forced to dance for 12 hours at a time? Were you whipped? We need to know exactly what happened. That's what the court needs. It needs this detail. And that's what we need people to tell us. So go to your NUP person, send an email, as I've said, and we can at least start that and send more information to the court. The more we send to the court, the greater the chance they'll take the case. Oh, that was, you expounded it very well. Um, Bruce, you well know that it's no longer news that Museven is a dictator who actually captured power in 1986 and up to date, he's still clinging on to power, of course, ruling Ugandans at gunpoint. But he, this gentleman still enjoys recognition on the international uh, stage. He still moves around Russia and all those other countries. What more can Ugandans do uh, to prevent him from enjoying that space? Is there any strategies that you can give out to concerned citizens on that matter? Yes, I can, JB. First, I want to say mm -hmm. this. The 70s ability to move around is very limited. He can go to Russia mm -hmm. with very little rule of law. He could go to China where there's no rule of law. He might go to Iran, which is a dictatorship, but he can't go to any democratic countries. He might go next door to Kenya, but that's about it. He's not welcome in democratic countries. All he can do is travel to dictatorships. So he doesn't really have that much freedom. He may make a big deal of going to Russia, but Russia itself is under indictment, or Putin was, by the ICC. It's not mm -hmm. a legitimate anymore in the world. So Museveni's ability to be in the world is very limited. He has lost all of that international respect he once had. You know, there was a meeting of African leaders. He got exactly 10 seconds in a picture with Biden. That's all yeah. he'll ever get. That's all he'll yeah. ever get. Remember, this is the same man who was in the White House with President Reagan. Today, Museveni will never get anything more than a five-second photo. And so his ability to move in the world is limited and the respect is held, he's held in is very low. Only fellow dictators will welcome him. And that's the limits of what he's had. So that's the first thing to say, he doesn't really have that respect anymore. What Ugandans can do, first of all, never ever tolerate losing your rights. Don't tolerate not being able to protest. Organize those meetings like the NUP did. Other groups can do that too. The major thing young people must do in Uganda is register to vote. This is really very important. We've seen those big rallies with 100,000 people. We have to make sure those people are going to vote because there may be huge crowds supporting Bobby Wine and the opposition. But if those people don't vote, if they say, I'm not a voter, well, then they can't get heard. Yes, it's true the government sometimes alters the votes, but if everyone who supports the NUP and the opposition votes, they're not gonna be able to change that election. But what happens is people hurt themselves, JB, when they won't register to vote. They've gotta sign up to vote, and when that election comes, they have to vote. And never stay home, you've gotta vote. The government can for forge some votes, but they can't forge four million. So if people sign up to vote and commit to voting, that's critical. And I saw an article recently, I think it was in the Daily Monitor, actually, that said just this, that young people in Uganda have to do more than protest. They got to vote when the time comes. So two things, you've got to hold those public meetings. You've got to speak out. You've got to register to vote. And other things can be done. For example, there's nothing stopping Ugandans from having a protest meeting in front of the state house. Have in the front of the state house? In front of the state house. Do you think Museveni is going to gun people down now that the ICC is looking at him? 
No. People have to have the courage to do these things. And then the government is seen to be powerless. It's important for people to take their rights and use them. This government is no longer able to shoot people down and beat them up in the streets. If that happens in front of cameras, in front of videos, the government is in serious trouble. People need to have the courage to organize and do that. People can have a national moment of silence for the torture victims in which the whole country stands still at 11 o'clock in the morning and for a full minute protests the torture victims. All of these things together will undermine the government and make the opposition stronger. So these things need to be done by people. Thank you for that. Uh, again, on the same issue, I want you to expound more on other strategies on the international scale, apart from pursuing the legal uh, process of, you know, dragging seven to ICC and all that kind of thing. Which other strategies on the international scale concern the Ugandans in the diaspora across the entire planet? Which other strategies can they employ in order to speed up this process of uh, creating a non-fictional social, economic and political change? in Uganda? Well, first of all, to support the opposition leaders when they come abroad to speak to people. It's very important to give that support. Also, the NUP and the other opposition parties all need funds. So people mm. outside of Uganda need to contribute because without money, these protest rallies can't happen. Without money, traveling the country is not possible. So people outside Uganda who are earning good livings should be contributing if they believe in this cause. They have to contribute money to the political parties. That's very important. Also, in the countries people live in, they should be meeting with members of parliament in their own countries where they're living outside of Uganda. They should meet with members of the cabinet in those countries and start to talk about how change is needed, how their own families have been arrested or tortured, and make the people who run these other governments, members of parliament in the Netherlands, in France, in America, understand the problem. They have to start lobbying the countries they live in to stop supporting Museveni's government. So those are some things right there. Also, they, people can take these things to the UN. There's a UN Human Rights Commission. People outside of Uganda can get a lawyer can get a human rights lawyer and bring complaints to the UN Human Rights Commission. All of these things together make a huge difference. They begin to weaken the willingness of people to support a dictator. And that weakness is really gone now. You saw all those rallies. The people of Uganda are ready for that change. People outside the country need to contribute money. They also need to work outside the country to talk to people in the other governments and use the UN, use the UN to make those filings, go to the Human Rights Commission, get lawyers outside of Uganda to do that. All of this makes a difference. And I hope that's helpful. It really is important for people to activate outside the country. Uh, on, the same, on the same note, what's your take on some Western countries that still shake Museveni's blood-stained hands? Because many Ugandans and actually on my side, this is evident. Western countries have uh, uh, financed Museveni. They have empowered his financial muscle. And, uh, you know, that's why, actually, he can get money to pay for the too much kind of administration that he runs in Uganda, paying the soldiers. Of course, he pays them peanuts, you know, paying the MPs, doing all, buying vehicles, uh, you know, those machines, guns, you know, bombs and all that kind of thing. They support him, they finance him. And before we wind up, what is your take on that? And which kind of message would you give to Ugandans in the diaspora? I would say Ugandans in the diaspora must protest those governments. They must go to their congressmen in the US and say, this has to stop. My relative was arrested and brutalized. My relative was killed. I was tortured. You need to talk in Congress and stop this financing of a dictator. People in the diaspora must talk to those governments. And every government that's a democracy has members of parliament who will talk to ordinary people. If you live in the Netherlands, your member of parliament will talk to you. If you live in the US, your member of Congress will talk to you. If you live in Britain, your member of parliament will talk to you.
Don't be afraid to do that. That's important. It's very important. But the biggest message I would give is this. Yes, it's true. Governments outside have supported Museveni because he sends soldiers to the Sudan and to Somalia, and he supports the U.S. doing that. And my country, the U.S., has given a billion dollars a year. That is wrong. It's beginning to change. The World Bank cut off loans to Uganda. That's a big change. But the big message, JB, I give is this. Don't worry about what happens outside Uganda. Worry about what happens in Uganda. Use your rights to make sure this government is defeated. Use your rights to protest en masse all the time to keep that going. Because eventually the government's going to make a mistake and it's going to use violence and then it will be forced from power. But never worry about what people outside do. Outsiders cannot give you your freedom. Freedom for Uganda can be found only by Ugandans. My message is Ugandans are the key to freedom. Don't worry about the outside world. Use your rights in Uganda. The government can't stop a protest under the law. The government will no longer use violence. It can't risk it. Use your rights. That's the key to change. Keep using those rights every day. And don't worry about what happens outside the country. It's you in Uganda that need to make that change. As we wind up, what final message or advice do you give to the entire Ugandan community? Or they should leave everything for ICC to, you know, finish everything? The ICC is not the answer to Ugandan's freedom. It may help. The answer to Ugandan's freedom is to speak your mind, join those protests, stand in the street and protest, organize a protest, register to vote. Join when the opposition has a rally. Never stop asserting your rights because that is what will make the change. Many dictatorships have fallen. Gabon, for example, dictatorship was removed. In Gambia, the dictatorship was gone. South Africa, apartheid fell. Museveni's regime will go out of power if people in Uganda assert their rights and make it clear they're no longer going to tolerate this. Ugandans also have to talk to each other. Older Ugandans are the source of Museveni's votes. Younger people in Uganda must talk to their parents, to their aunts and uncles, to their grandparents and say, why do you vote for him? Why do you vote for a dictator after 40 years? You must speak to each other in Uganda. And that's the key. Ugandans are the key to freedom. Not the ICC, not America. Ugandans in Uganda are the key to freedom. Uh, thank you for your time, Bruce. Till next time, thanks for being on the show. Thank you always, JP.